when I'm around some people, they dislike the church. I mean, I mean, they dislike the church, and I can understand there's some reasons why some people dislike the church. Not necessarily Hosanna, but church in, in general. Uh, so we talked a little bit about uh, with all its problems, and we shared a little bit in the uh, book of Revelations about the seven churches and all the issues that one had left his first love, one was letting the woman Jezebel control him. It had all kinds of all kinds of different issues that it had in the church. But the Bible says Jesus was standing in the midst of a church. And so in the midst of the church with all its issues and all its problems, all its different beliefs. I mean, you got some churches a big worship church. You got some big churches that are big soul winning churches. You got some churches that focus on the Word of God. And so there's different churches in different places. But whatever we want to call it, God's standing in the midst of her. In fact, we also learned last week that God said, I will build my church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. There's some people who think the church is a bunch of wimps and fixing to go down. Let me tell you something now. God said, I will build my church. I will, I will grow them, mature them, and grow them, and I'm a part of that church, amen, and he's working on me, and I want to be a voice in our society that we live in, in our culture we live in. I want to be able to just speak to it as much as possible. Also last week, we learned that the church is not a church building. Everybody say amen. amen. Because if the church was a church building, I feel like we'd have to have more brick, you know what I'm saying, and more fancy stuff. And our baskets that we collect offerings in wouldn't be a noodle strain from Walmart. We'd have fancy one with lace and all that type of business, you know what I'm saying? But you know what? That, that is not what the church is. You're the church. We're the church. And I would rather create an environment for you to be able to worship, enjoy God, than I wouldn't make a building look right on the outside. Amen. So we're the church. And you know what? The gates of hell is not going to prevail against you. You may feel like you're down and things may seem a little difficult with us sometimes. And God promises that we, we wouldn't go through them. We, it, we, we would go through them, but he promises that we would come through them in Jesus' name. We learned that the word church means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public arena. An assembly gathered together. So uh, you could say that if y'all meet for the Kiwana Clubs or the Lions Club, if y'all meet over there, y'all are in a sense of ecclesia. You know what I'm saying? When y'all meet in the honky tonks, in a sense, y'all are an ecclesia. But when we meet together in a building like this, as believers, we're ecclesia, but we're an ecclesia called out for God. It's a different, you know what I'm saying? The world calls us out, you know, and does different things. But when we come together, God has called you out of your church this morning. It's the weather as cold as it was. God has called you out, and you come to a place like this. And guess what doing? What's going to happen? God is going to build on you a little bit. He's going to correct us a little bit, encourage us a little bit. And that way we'll be great when we go back out into the world and we become the church in our community. We become the church in our schools. We become the church within our families. And that is a passion that I have to teach you and help you to do those things. And this week as I was driving down the road thinking about some of the stuff I've been sharing about, I, 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 the question come to my mind, what would this local group of called out ones, the church, look like if Jesus was the pastor? I mean, I want you to think about what would this local church of called out ones, in other words, y'all come to this church and Jesus was y'all's pastor, what would our church look like? It wouldn't look like a lot of these churches, I can tell you. Number one, and ain't even on my notes, we need to look like our community. And our community ain't all black and our community ain't all white. Or Asian and Mexican. We need to be a, be a conglomerate of what the body of Christ is in the area is. And I thank God Hosanna represents well in Jesus' name. So let's look at the scripture. What kind of church would Jesus pastor? Y'all want to know? Now I hope you want to know because you want to know, not because it's Sunday. You know, I hope I want you want to know for knowledge that you can do something with the knowledge you have. All right, so let's look at it quick, right quick. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 through 13 goes like this. So I'm just, I'm just looking at some of the stuff Jesus did while he was on earth because that's the kind of stuff he would want us to represent today. Look what he says. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many other tax collectors 
and other disputable, dis, excuse me, disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked him, asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? You know, we have people say that about us here. We really do. And I'm good with it. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come, call, come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. The first thing I think if Jesus was building the church, there would always be some scum in the church. Now I know there's always some sanctified, holy, righteous folks, but there would all be some folks in there kind of like I was when I first started going to church. I was as messed up as messed up as come. In fact, guys, I'm telling you, this is honest God truth. I was 19 years of age, and I went down to the altar. I got up from the altar, and I put my arm around this girl to say hello to her, and I looked to the back, and the deacons back there were telling them to get away from me. They were going. That didn't make me mad. You know what that did? The Holy Spirit spoke to me then, and he said, that is not what I'm about. And that is how come in 1986, God had begun to prepare me and help me to build a church like Jesus. And I want to, and I want to step back regularly and say, what type of church is it that we need to be? Number one, Jesus hangs around folks. Jesus would build a church where people would need. So what was his mindset for hanging around the outcast? Of that day. See, because a lot of churches, they don't want you to hang around the outcasts. And some of it is because you're too weak to hang around the outcasts. And some of us don't want our children to hang around the outcasts. And that's a bigger issue. I can honestly say this at all my years. Even though we taught our children, man, we hung around whatever comes our way, and we were able to teach our children how, what, we didn't criticize people, but we were able to teach people how, my daughters, how, and what, when, and where, and they've been blessed to be able to hang around people. I could tell you stuff they went through at school, and when they went to college, that would embarrass some of you. Number one, Jesus hung out with outcasts because he was creating a model of how to build his church. Y'all get that? Jesus was hanging around what the world calls outcast people or scum because Jesus was trying to model to the people that was watching him how he would build and pastor his church. See, society sees people according to stereotypes. You know what I'm saying? They do the church. That's a white church. You know what I'm saying? That's a, why are you going to a white church? You know, that's a black church. Why are, you, why are you going to a black church? You know, that church up there, they get a little wild up there. They like singing that music and getting a little loud. You know, I'd rather do it this way. So somehow we have a tendency in society to stereotype people. I mean, come on. I mean, the re I, I don't want to pick on my bro, bro, that I work with all the time, but James comes on the scene, he's got a beard, he got long hair, and if you ain't careful, the stereotype would say, you know what? That's one of them there tweaker drug addicts, you know what I'm saying there? And one of them drug addicts, you better stay away from him. And we stereotype people, you don't know anything of what's going on with people. And because we stereotype people, we're afraid to get around people. And we'll talk about that here, that here in a minute. See, society sees people according to stereotypes. Jesus, however, saw the needs of individuals and called out to them. Peter was on the boat. Hey, Peter, come over here. Hey, Simon, come over here. Hey, come, down to that tr come out of that tree and come down here and talk to me. Jesus always called out to people that was usually contrary to religious people, called out them, giving them an invitation to come and see their life change. And, that's, and, and, and they said, Jesus, why do you hang around sinners? Why does your teacher hang around sinners? The word sinner there means somebody who is devoted to sin. Jesus hung around them, but guess what he did? He wanted to call them out of their devotion to sin. 
That don't mean they didn't still sin some. He's just called them out of their devotion to it. And see, in a church sometimes, we got people who are just getting saved, and they don't know how to act re religious like some of y'all know how to act. They don't know how to act self-righteous, or they don't know how to act like church people. So they still may walk up to the front door with a cigarette, thump it out, and become to the front row and praise and worship the Lord. They haven't learned. A self-righteous person will get mad at that. I can't believe they thumped a cigarette out on the church property. Well, they are more of the church than the property is the church. And I really don't want no thumping cigarettes in the front door, you know what I'm saying? But we sure not going to degrade people that walk through the door like that. Can somebody say amen? amen. Okay, so Jesus, and look at me. Jesus don't want us to stay sinners. Once we become saved, and somebody asked me this today, once you become a child of God, you are you a sinner? And I say, no, you're not. I say, you're a saint that sins. You're no longer a sinner. You're no longer devote yourself to sin. You're somebody who loves Jesus, but you do stupid things every once in a while. There's a total big, there's a total big difference there. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Next thing, Jesus would, would Jesus' church would be people of compassion. People ask me what kind of political reviews you, uh, what you call yourself. I tell them I am a moral conservative with compassion. I am a moral conservative with compassion. Just jump in a little bit, all right? I, I don't, I'm against abortion. You know what I'm saying? I, I know you got freedom. Yeah, you got in America, you got freedom. I get it. But you know, I'm, a, I'm against taking lives. I've seen too many videos of a seven-month-old baby running from the tongs that's trying to kill him. I've seen it. I'm sorry. I just, I just can't go there, okay? But anyway, but you know what? I have compassion on those that that's happened to. I'm not going to put them down and jump on them. So I am a moral conservative. I am what a conservative. I believe in the Word of God first. It is my course of direction, but I have compassion on people that don't have that knowledge or that liberty yet of understanding things. So Jesus was a person who had compassion. I believe his church would be people of compassion. Let's, let's look at a scripture here, Luke chapter 10, verse 27 through 37. Then the man answered, and Jesus talking to this guy and said, hey, you know, he asked him, what, what do you think the uh, religious, you know, what, what's the Bible say about things or the Torah say, a thing, say about things? And he said it like this. The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Then the man wanted to justify his actions. Here we go. See, some of us want to justify our opinions. Some of us want to justify our things, so we try to figure out ways to escape what we're doing. You know, we, we come up with ways to escape the reason why we're doing stupid stuff. Well, let's look at, he says, look at what he says. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? <laughs> you get that? I know we got that today. Who is my neighbor? I mean, we ask that kind of stuff. Oh, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. By chance, notice these examples he gives. By chance, a priest comes along. That would be a pastor, a deacon. An elder, Sunday school teacher. By chance, a priest come along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed over to the other side. Now, y'all know y'all deal with this sometimes. There, you don't know how many times I'm driving down the road and I see this person walking and I'm trying to determine, do I do this or not? You know you do. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it tells us to move on or pick them up. But see, we... We have found ways to justify things. Well, you can't pull somebody over. They might kill you. But what if the Holy Spirit tells you to pick somebody up? See, we've created ways to justify our actions being contrary to what God would have to say. 
Not everybody that comes in here needing money for their electric bill gets money. Sometimes they do. You can't just say, no, we ain't giving money out to people. It's a matter of trying to be spirit-led in this old life that we live. I had somebody call me the other day and wanted me to pay a $750 electric bill. I about fell out on the floor and said, darling, we can't help you with $750. I may want to go somewhere else. And I ain't putting them down. We just, that's, I just can't do that. And who is my neighbor, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip to Jerusalem, to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying, he crossed over to the other side and passed by him. But look at the next example. And a temple assistant. You could call it one of his buds. You could call it one of the assistant pastors. You could call it whatever you want to, but obviously the priest has been uh, uh, discipling the, the, the assistant. Well, let's look at the assistant. And the temple assistant walked over. At least he walked over. You know what I'm saying? The assistant uh, 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 walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by the other side. Then, see, because let me just, I'm chasing a rabbit here. Because what happens is sometimes when you walk over and look, you say, mm, mm, mm. You know, if they just wouldn't have been doing that, they probably wouldn't be in that situation. I wonder what they did or deserved to be in that pit. Oh, look at him. He had the Budweiser shirt on. He, <laughs> I seen one this past week. <laughs> Had a had marijuana tight uh, what's them things these girls wear nowadays spandex pants had marijuana leaves all the way up. Rodney changed the tires for them and sent them on down the road. <laughs> I back in my brain I've been saying yeah you probably wouldn't hit the curb if you wouldn't been smoking all that stuff all right. That's, that was kind of what was going on in my mind. But you know what? Thank God that sometimes we got, you know, I'd have probably been in that situation of the, uh, the priest who walked to the other side. All right? I don't want to be like that type of person because you know what? Jesus wasn't that type of person. But look what he said. Then a despised Samaritan. What is a despised Samaritan? Oh, Lord, help us. A Samaritan is what we would call a half-breed. You know, the type of people that don't feel comfortable in a black church because they're not all black and somebody feels uncomfortable in a white church because they got a little black in them and both churches make them feel like they're not welcome and when they're not made to feel like they're welcome. Ain't, ain't, ain't we touching some toes here this morning without really slapping somebody? We're getting, that, we're getting right down to the issue. And so this half-breed half does something that two religious folks don't. Then a half-breed come along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion. Probably because he's probably been there before. The Bible says those who have been forgiven a much, loves much. He felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? In Jesus... Jesus asked, the, Jesus asked, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Yeah. 
Mm. In today's society, sometimes when you preach, you got to preach with a shotgun. Scatter shot. Because we all up in here, we all up here got crazy mindsets. And I guess what I'm saying to all of us, let's at least allow God to challenge some of the stuff that we've been taught through the years. Let's allow God to come in and change our heart because you know what? At the end of the day, that person could be a major player in your local assembly. If you do see, I was one of them. I, I would have been the one that would have been welcome in most of the church. And I end up becoming a pastor. I was the one carrying gallons of beer to the church. My mom and them had dance floors and kegs. Sorry, mom. My, my mom waved at us like that. We all got saved together. Hallelujah. I would go and fill them kegs up with beer, and I would bring them to the church in the back of my 1974 Chevy Vega. And buddy, at halftime or whatever we're doing, we'd flop it up. But one day I got caught. I got caught. I wish I could talk to this man today. I got caught by this man, and he talked to me lovingly. He talked to me sternly, and he talked to me about Jesus Christ. And it did something in my heart later. He didn't kick me out of the church. He didn't put me down. He talked with me. He talked me firmly, and he dealt with me. And lo and behold, I bet he never knew that one day all them good little church kids, because I wasn't raised in the church. My family wasn't raised in church. All those other kids I was hanging around were raised in the church. I wasn't. And I'm probably the only one out of all of them we hung together that's a pastor and a minister today. Listen to it right here. The fear that led the priest and, and the temple assistant to ignore the beaten man is still prevalent today. Let me read it again. The fear that led the priest and the temple assistant to ignore the beaten man is still prevalent today. What was the fear? The fear is to avoid situations and people that make us feel uncomfortable. So many, I didn't love y'all, but so many of your children are socially inept. I used to say another word. They, they don't know how to handle being around people different from themselves. They only know how to walk in the people that's in their lane. And that's not good. Because, listen, you can't always be with them. I'm amazed. This is what I, I really am amazed at this. Through the years, I had people that wouldn't let their kids come to our church, but would let them go to South Panola or North Delta. That was always amazing me because I know we got some rough stuff to go on in Hosanna sometimes. There might be a fight break out. Somebody might be to do a vape. There like, some of that stuff might go on. But my Lord, have mercy. What goes on in the school system don't even count because I went to public school system. You, you see I'm getting that? So we, we, we are raising kids just like those priests and priests are simple because you know what? There's so much fear in us that we are, we, we, we're scared to allow our children to be around people or situations that make them feel uncomfortable. And this, is, this justifies their action. Look, we do this by justifying our action by choosing our neighbor. Now listen to me, I'm not saying we send our kids around trouble, but we don't go around and snatch them out by the hair of the head, condemning the, the, the neighbor while we're dragging them away from them. Oh, uh, y'all ain't hear me. Some of y'all right now, y'all still back on the half breed thing. Y'all, y'all can't even. Y'all ain't even. Y'all just, y'all, y'all just can't get your head out of what I said about that. I mean, you, he said it. He said it. Who cares? The different half breeds that I know that are in here were like, yeah, I know, I know what I'm talking about. Woo woo, I know just exactly how it feels. Can somebody tell me something here? Look at me. Listen, as a result, listen to me. As a, re a result, our children become socially unskilled, fearful, and judgmental because we do not teach them how to have relationship. Proverbs says when an adult walks into the room to stand up. Do you know that? In other words, when there's an older person, somebody walks in, you stand up and you greet them. Half of your children, you walk into the room, their head still at the table. I want to go over and slap them in the back of the head. But then I realize they're being raised by some of you. Listen to me. Teach your children to respect people. Teach your children to love people. And, and I'm not trying to be, teach them to love people. 
Oh, Jesus, Brandon said, I'm going back up to Children's Church. <laughs> listen, listen to this right. To be honest, a lot of times our children despise us because we criticize the people for the same types of things that we're doing, but just different. You know, they're sinning, but it's just different sin. And so we criticize people out there, and then they come home, and they're watching us being just Oh, I really didn't mean to go this way, but we're here, so let's just play around with it a little bit. You know, there, just dig a little bit. And y'all be careful, some of you older ones. Y'all ain't got children no more, so you're like, amen, hallelujah. If you don't raise there, and they're crazy, all right? Some of us are still raising children or grandchildren. Listen to me. If we would teach our children to have compassion on people, they would carry a lot less load of comparison. Y'all got that? If we would just teach our children not to be so judgmental or critical, they would, they would carry this load of comparing themselves with everybody. But because we critique everything that everybody's doing in society, they live underneath that load that they're living with in their mind. Now, y'all ain't getting it. I'm telling you, our children, they are carrying a load that they should not have to carry. It should be acknowledged. You're going to love it. This is what I taught my kids and my players that played for me through the years. Unless the coach asks you to sin, if she says start running like Forrest Gump, start running. If they tell you to do push-ups, get her done. But if they ask you to do anything contrary to the Scripture of your conscience, you walk away from there fast as you can, and I'll be praying on, the way that I, on my way there that I won't go crazy on them. But other than that, we should respect and deal with adults. Young people, if you want to make it in life, it's all about your attitude and the way you're, they, they will put up with your less education because they put up with me, all right? But they want you to have an attitude of gratitude. They want you to have an attitude that cares about life. You know, do something like me, like me and Brother Ray, I walk back there and pick up piece that white string up. I can't stand that there. Put it in my pocket. Be that type of person on your way to the job site. Reach over, pick that can up, throw it in the trash. You're, there are people out the boss will say, that's somebody who cares when nobody was watching. And I don't know why I'm talking about all this stuff. But listen to me. Hey, come, listen to me. See, look, look at this right here. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13 says it like this. Of course we wouldn't dare to classify ourselves or compare ourselves with those who rate them so highly? <laughs> Not us. How stupid they are. They make up their own standard to measure themselves by. They judge themselves by their own standards. And that's what's going on with our society today. Instead of judging things by God's standards leaving the rest of it alone, we're carrying a load because we have judged people and that same judgment we have give out now has come upon us. Remember I told y'all last week I refused to go fast on Green Road even if the people ride my tail? And then the other day, a guy almost ran over me and I yelled at him when he went by. Then the very next day, I was looking at my phone, and I almost ran over a guy on that same road. And the Lord's like, you big old hypocrite, you. <laughs> we just better be careful. Say, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I love you. Love you. Like, Not the number one sign. All right, so look at me right quick. See, what's going on with our children today? I'm not trying to be funny, but what I'm trying to tell you is our children today are comparing themselves with so many people because our, as parents, listen to me, as parents, we have judged other people by our own justification. We justify our actions, not by the Word of God, but by our own justification. And our kids are looking at us saying, what? 
Let me give you another for instance. When I used to substitute teach at Polk, one of the young black boys that come to the church here, I noticed that his pants were sagging. I caught him outside. I said, son, what you, what, pick your pants up. You don't need to do that. And he started crying. He said, Brother Damon, Mama didn't have no clothes, and I had to wear my older brother's clothes. You talking about feeling like a dog. I said, you okay, buddy? I'm sorry. Put him in there. See, sometimes we stereotype people, and we don't know what the real deal is. You see I'm getting that? We got to be careful. Automatically stereotyping people for different situations, and we don't even have a clue what's going on. Our first motivation should be love. Our, our first motivation should be compassion on everybody. Have I already read Luke 7, 36 through 50? So, number, let's get to the next. So, so what would Jesus' church look like? Jesus would pastor a group of people that were honest with themselves on their journey of becoming like Christ and have compassion on others along the way. That's number one. That's how Jesus, he would, he would, they would be, wouldn't dog on themselves on their journey and they had to have compassion on others. On others. Well, let me ask you something. What would Jesus' church message be before his sermon? Y'all get this? What would Jesus' church, y'all, message be before Jesus stood up and preached his sermon? Let's look at it right quick. Luke 6, 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his hometown and sat down and eat. Went to his home and sat down and eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind them at his feet. Now I stopped right then. I'm like, wait a minute here. Pharisees did not allow that kind of stuff. So how did this woman feel so comfortable bringing her alabaster box passing right by the Pharisees? You know why? She had been there before. <laughs> she probably had paid a nightly visit to the Pharisee. So when she found out Jesus was there, she she had probably looked at the Pharisee would have said something. She had probably said, "Y'all know it." She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who, Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, <laughs> we do a lot of that saying to ourselves, don't we? And this, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. And then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. Simon replied. Then Jesus told this story. A man loaned money to people, to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But the, neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved more after that? Simon answers, I suppose. Y'all get that? Self-righteous. I suppose the one whom he canceled the large debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. Now, what, what, what that question is, what would the message of the church be before Jesus stood up and made a message, give his message? When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off of my feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss. And from this time, from the time I first came in, she has not kissing my feet. Look at he said here. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins 
They are many and have been forgiven. So she was shown, shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You neglected. You didn't. So number one, they would create an environment of safety for the unchurched people. A church that Jesus would pastor. The message that we as a congregation are to give before they even hear the main message is create an environment for those who feel awkward already. They may not dress like church people. They may not even smell like church people. Their car on the parking lot may have come in smoking. Y'all get that? See, listen to me. I don't think churches intentionally make, a dif make it difficult for the unchurches to feel safe. But most churches are not intentional in making people feel safe. They don't mean to make you feel uncomfortable. But are you intentional in making people feel comfortable? Let me give you an example of this. Wednesday night, and she may be here. A young lady comes. She sit right back there in the back section back there. She sat there by herself. All my good church folks come walking in. All my good church folks passed her by. And there she was with her backpack and her little baby. So I walked up to her and said, sweetie, now you don't have to, but we have a nursery. She goes, I, I, I don't know. I said, man, look, we have a nursery, and if the baby starts crying, they will text you, and you can come get her to feel comfortable. Now, darling, you don't have to do this. We just want you to know it's an opportunity. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what group I went to last week. I don't know where I went. I don't know. I've been here three times. I don't know. Listen to me. Well, darling, let me tell you how this goes. Are you married? She didn't answer. I said, well, we've got two married couples, people. If you're married, you don't have, if, you, if he's not with you, you can still go if you need to go. Hope you self-righteous. Church uh, marriage people don't have a problem with that, but if they're married, then... Not that you are self-righteous, but you know what I'm getting at. And then I said, darling, there's a group over here with uh, this got all kinds of folks. And then there's singles back there. And so I didn't know if she'd come because of drugs. I wasn't going to say, hey, man, are you one of them CR type people here? If you're one of them CR people, you stuck with me. And I said, now, CR people, we come in and have Bible study, and then we kind of break down in groups. And I walked her, and they greeted her. Oh, honey, come on in here. We'll take care of that baby. If he cries, come on in here. My question it is, what was the message being preached to her before she went to a small group? My question is, some of you knew, what, what did we preach to you before you even listened to me preach? I, I hope my parking lot people waved at you. I hope my greeters shook your hand and hugged your neck. I hope when you walked in, somebody else greeted you. That's my prayer. Because some of us, we talk to the same old people that we've already talked to seven times on, on, on phone and checked their Facebook. Let me give you another example. I went to this church one time in Hattiesburg. And before you walked into the sanctuary, it had a sign. Children, no children in the sanctuary. I get it. Because if you want to worship, you know, you want to worship without kids crying. But what, what message are we sending to that lady? Do you think Jesus would be more apt to say, hey, man, put the baby outside. Y'all get to sit in the car. We're going to take a little bit of time for y'all to worship me. Now, then I was the worship leader, so I was like, yeah, the kids need to find a home to go to. But now as a pastor, 
Jesus would say, bring them in. You know what? We'll either turn the music a little louder or somebody will help you be a mama and grab that little baby and shake it. You know, they worship every Sunday. They can take a break and help work your kid. That's what type of church Jesus would do. Jesus would create a church before the message was even preached. Their heart had already been locked into the church. They already felt like this is my church. This is the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's what I want us to be. And that's what Jesus would want us to be. Number two, the type of church, the, the, the church that would be preaching a message before the message time would do, they would understand their purpose for gathering places and different programs. See, church people ought to know what their purpose are for Sunday morning. Their purpose are for Wednesdays. See, the church is preaching the message before the message. You preached it already here this morning. You did. Everybody in here preached the message this morning already. You did. What we're expressing. Let me, let, me give, let me give you a for instance. As a coach, even when I was at Northwest, when I would walk on the campus, I would look at how intentional they were. Did they have pitching lanes for their pitchers? To pitch in before the game started. If they didn't, I'd say, well, they don't value pitchers very much. First thing I did when I went to Northwest, get some pitching lanes in here because you know what? Pitchers need, you need to value your pitchers. What kind of warm up area hitting things you need to do? Well, you don't value hitting very much. We're going to eat your lunch and send you home. And at church, when they walk in, we must be intentional. Listen to me. We must be intentional to deal with unchurched type people that come in here that don't know how to act. That is so funny. <laughs> See, the days, are com- the days of coming to church to be lectured to are over. Do you hear me? The days of coming to church to hear some preacher lecture you are over. We must create an environment that would cause people to want to connect with us. The days of one leader being, being, the, uh, being the show, one man being the running the show and everything are over with. You hear me? One man can't visit everybody. One man can't do all of it, and I don't want to. I want to create leaders like Jesus did, create leaders to do those type of things. The days of the facilities being more valuable than the individual are over. Y'all got that? When we value the facility more than we know the individual, they will not put up with it. They're gone. The days of your children being in an environment that will not influence them are over. We must create environments for our children because if we got your children, guess what? They will beg you to come back. If you think this generation is going to sit there and beat their kids while you up hopping, hallelujah, them days are over with. They will stay at home. I know you beat your kid, and you made them correct, and you took that old fan and smacked them. I get that. You do that nowadays, they'd be, oh, Lord, this never mind. Y'all know what I'm saying. Listen to this. For all those on staff and have been with us for years, y'all get this, remember this statement. Time erodes awareness. For all my church people who have been with us for a long time and my staff, Time erodes your ability to be aware of what's going on around you. The longer you are at a place, the less you're aware of the need for change. And I got this little statement. Just ask your mate. Oh, y'all did uh, get that with that weird. The longer you married, well, honey, I loved you, didn't you? You don't show me, oh, I loved you, didn't you? I married you on the first day, hallelujah. You stay like that, you're in trouble. And I got my wife on the front row, and I'm having to change a lot of things. Huh? 
We must be aware of what's going on around us or you'll lose everything you got. Just period. Okay? For the church, let's be aware of what's going on. I'm, I, everybody say he's heading downhill now. He's ready to close her out. I tell people all the time, if you'll take off your religious hat when you come to our church, you may want to start attending regularly. Also, you may not want to carry your children up to children's church because they'll wear you to death to come back. And we're trying right now. See, I'm, I'm looking. I got all my staff saying, y'all go get with y'all's groups of people. Let's listen to what they got to say because we probably need to make some little changes around here already. And we ain't even been in here just a little bit. So what's your message before what? I'm talking to you individually. We'll close now. What is your message before the message? Young people, what message are you telling the adults? What message are you telling other people your age? Like it or not, you're giving them a message. Adults, what message are you sending to other people? I'm serious. What message are you sending? Before I even preach. What message are you sending at your home? Before they come hear our message. What message are you sending on the way to church? <laughs> I've only rode to church probably 10 times in 35 years, 36 years, 35 years of marriage. Because I would probably be in big trouble for that. I get to church because me and Brandon, I'd be like, hurry up, woman. Are you crazy? Let's go. We're late. But what message are we, what message are we sending to our children? What, what, what message are we sending to our children? We're sending a message before the message. What, what, what message are you sending as you enter in to the gathering place? Y'all ever do this? Don't talk right now. People might be looking. Walk through Walmart. The whole time I'm like, well, I wish you'd hurry up. We done been down this aisle five times. Let's get the milk and get out of here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't, don't Y'all know I'm talking the truth. Come into church. Dragging your kids in, you done beat them, and they're trying to, you better like to, you be happy when you walk in there. That's what my mama used to do to me. My mama used to whip me and say, boy, you get it again if you act up when you go in that place. Everybody say, your kids are so good. I want to say, because she beats us. <laughs> Close, look, okay. What's your message, what's your message during praise and worship? What's your message? I'll leave that one there. What, during praise and worship and we're singing songs about gratitude and we're, or, I want to speak the name of Jesus. What's your message? Man, I'll start right then praying, God, I thank you for people that's in this church, Lord God, that's coming and got a need, God. I thank you that you're going to reach down and touch them, God. I thank you that you're going to send this church out in this community, God, and those that are hurting. and those that, That's what I get. And when the next song comes on, I start, yeah, glory to God. I love you so much. Change the keys where I can scream it out a little louder. You know what I'm saying? Get in the right key for me to do it. Man, because I just want to do that. My question to you is, what message are you giving before the message? Last, and two more. What message are you giving when you bring your offering? Seriously, what, what, what message are you bringing when you bring your offering? Or send it by text? What are you giving? Everybody say, oh, me, move to the next point. Let's get on down here. Got awful silent there. 
And then the last one. What message are you giving during the message? Uh, what message are you giving during the message? When, you, when the message is going on, are you? What message are you giving during the message? Because ain't everybody giving a message? Everybody is. Everybody's giving a message. Young people, your message may be, I don't care to be here. And let me, let me, let me say this to you. Hosanna, you may like us or not like us. But we're doing everything in our abilities to help you love the church. Now, I don't know if your attitude sometimes you have is because of your parents or what. But man, I'm telling you, we're doing it. We're loving you when you have a bad attitude, even though I want to slap you on the back of the head. You know, we, we are. We try to give you the best environment you can with what we can do. We're not trying to be worldly, but we do want to create an environment you like. I mean, we got a pool table, you got basketball courts, you got video games, you got sound system, you got light, you got your own praise and work, you got it all. I mean, come on. I mean, what, what's up? Adults with us, look at me, as your pastor, what's up? We're preaching messages to unchurched people when they come in here, when they look at us. What's going on with them? And I'm going to shut up here because I'm, I'm not interested in condemning and putting this down. I'm just saying this, that the we are preaching messages. Jesus would have us, when unchurched people come in here or folks that feel, we would want them to feel safe. We, we, we want to go to that one that nobody's talked to and we would go out of our way to make them as feel as comfortable as we could. That's what we should do. That's what we want to do. And again, I'll say to everybody, if we're not doing the best in the job, it ain't because we ain't trying. Okay? So don't judge us by what you see a few doing. Okay? Jesus said he's building this church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The days the big preachers are gone. They're all dying off. It's just us. Just us. You're the church. You're the church. And you're preaching a message. That's a lot of pressure, I realize it. But it ain't if you just keep two things in mind. Love God. And love your neighbor. Don't allow fear to rob you of loving your neighbor. They pull a gun on you to say live, to live as Christ and to die as gain. When I used to go down into the inner cities in Baton Rouge, I didn't care. I love those sweet mamas that didn't have no much. And I know all you people, really, I'd dress up as Santa Claus and go right down into the ghettos and the poor people. And I'd hug them and I'd hand out gifts and I'd talk to them about Jesus and I'd do all that. Forget some of the religious junk people mad about. Take your holidays, love people, and just enjoy people. Amen? Amen. All righty. Y'all stand up. <laughs> I want to be the type of church Jesus would pastor. And I just say to all of us, we just need to check ourselves sometimes, huh? We just need to check ourselves sometimes. Brother Rafer used to call it a get right room. We need to get a get right room. Amen. If you're in this place and you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, I mean, you may have went to vacation Bible school and seen him die for you and you're like, Man, I want that, but life hadn't treated you well and life's been difficult for you. 
Salvation is this. The, the Pharisees trusted in themselves and they become religious. The sinners trusted in Jesus and became righteous. Say, I'm not trusting in how much money I give. I'm not even trusting in what kind of message I'm giving on Sunday morning. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone. <laughs> Remember what I was saying? If, if you were to die right now and stand for Jesus, why would you, why would you, what would you tell him to him for, let you, for him to let you in? For D, it's just one thing. I trust in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before his throne. So let's say it like this. When you leave this place, you can know without a doubt. Without a doubt, if you believe it in your heart. Say it with me like this. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for coming out of the grave. Thank you that you're interceding for me right now. And I will make it because of you. I accept your great salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Won't you give the Lord a big hand clap of praise? <laughs>